So to sort of keep everyone's interest, since we're in the mom hall room, I invited Charo down to play acoustic guitar for us during the lecture. So she'll be coming in shortly. Anyway, while this is getting uh, put in, I really wanted to thank uh, Morristown uh, attendings uh, that trained to live and tortured me throughout the three years of residency. I especially want to give a thanks to uh, Dr. Shi for being a mentor and a friend throughout my career, likely the most instrumental person in my career, and uh, Colleen Mayer, our residency coordinator, who was the glue who kept us all together and let it be known that Colleen confessed to me that I am her favorite resident of all time. <laughs> <laughs> Dale, <laughs> are you in the audience? I have to get a password. Let me go get her password real quick now. So I'll uh, sort of just introduce what I'm going to do. In the interest of time, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, hyperthermic syndrome, specifically malignant hyperthermia, uh, serotonin syndrome, and neuroleptic malignant syndrome. And this is not the total of uh, hyperthermic syndromes. There's stiff person syndrome, there's lethal catatonia, and so forth. But those are probably the most important and the ones as ED physicians we're more likely to see. Of those hyperthermic syndromes, malignant hyperthermia is probably the one that we have the best understanding of. And thereafter, when anything is called a syndrome, you have to sort of think that they don't really know exactly what's going on, but they recognize that there is something going on, enough to typify something as a syndrome. Now, malignant hyperthermia was first described in 1960 as a reaction to general anesthetics. And at that time, they did not have the uh, monitoring equipment that we have today. Hence the name malignant, uh, signifying the potentially fatal nature of the disease, and hyperthermia, signifying an end function of the pathological process. But it's sort of misleading in that hyperthermia didn't occur in all patients, and it really signified the end of premorbid state. And uh, malignant hyperthermia would more likely, or better be called, malignant hypermetabolism. And as we can see, uh, malignant hyperthermia, we'll talk about how uh, that process stimulates uh, metabolism both in indirect and in direct way. Uh, it's hyperthermic AC. No, the other one. How about that? Yeah. Okay, we are also going to attach this bad boy. And acetylcholine will uh, bind to postsynaptic receptors, 
uh, specifically the nicot nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, and cause an influx of sodium. As sodium influxes, calcium will be um, released down the transverse tubule. And in addition, we have sodium going in and potassium going out of the sarcolemma. Looking at it a little bit closer, these transverse tubulars are um, regular uh, in, um, invaginations of the sarcolemma, and they serve to propagate and act potential quickly to the skeletal muscle. And lying in these transverse tubules, we have dihydropyridine receptors, or the L-type calcium channels. And you should make note that these L-type calcium channels in skeletal muscles are not sensitive to calcium channel blockers. It's specifically the L-type calcium channels in myocardial muscle as well as vascular smooth muscle that's susceptible. And integrated in this dihydropyridine receptor is a calmodulin, which acts as a sort of calcium sensor. And it's very, very geographically closely related to the ryanidine receptor, or the calcium channel. When a stimulus comes down, such as sodium coming down, and calcium is sensed by these dihydropyridine receptors, these L-type calcium channels, which are the long sustained conductive calcium channels, will open and will allow the efflux of calcium in the sarcoplasm in particular. Now, we will maintain the concentration of calcium by the calcium ATPH, which will pump calcium once it's sequestered or once it's not being used anymore into the sarcoplasm in particular. As well, we'll take it out by a pump from the sarcolemma using the energy of the hydrolysis of ATP. Now, what you have to understand is these pumps are very active in maintaining a concentration in the sarcolemma, or sorry, the sarcoplasm of calcium that is pale in comparison to that of outside. So any perturbation in calcium will have dramatic effects. Now, a, a, a non-contracting muscle has myosin that's bound to ATP. And upon calcium entering the sarcoplasm, calcium will bind to troponin C, which is like a, well not like, excuse me, it's a calmagulin binding protein. And that will cause a conformational change of tropomyosin, which will expose active binding sites on myosin. Now, the liberation of phosphate from myosin will cause myosin to, to take on a high energy state. Now when myosin takes on a high energy state, no contractions have occurred as of yet, but phosphate will be liberated and myosin with ADP will be hooked up to actin. Then myosin hooked up to actin with ADP, ADP will be liberated and we form active myosin. Notice now that myosin is low energy state and these two equations simulate the power stroke of the muscle. Now, with actinomycin plus ATP, we could convert the um, actinomycin cross-linking to the myosin with the ATP as it was in the resting state. Now, inherent in that is that we have to have ATP present to cause relaxation of skeletal muscle. If we do not have ATP present, such in vigorous activity, such as malignant hyperthermia, and I think the best way to think about malignant hyperthermia is picture the hardest you ever exercise in your life, and then multiply that by 4,000, 877.1, and then you're probably almost in the ballpark of what it would feel like to be uh, undergoing malignant hyperthermia. In any event, normally in our cell, in seconds, minutes, to hours, you can sort of see that first we get our energy from ATP to cause muscle contraction. Then we have creatine phosphate that donates phosphate to ADP, and then we have anaerobic metabolism as well as aerobic metabolism that's going to take us through our journey. Now, what you have to understand. When I speak of anaerobic metabolism, I'm not speaking of metabolism occurring in the absence of oxygen per se, because plenty of cells that have an abundance of oxygen still can undergo anaerobic metabolism. I'm speaking specifically of something other than molecular oxygen that's acting as a final electron acceptor. And in our uh, in the anaerobic metabolism, that final electron acceptor oxygen is converted to H2O when it accepts those electrons. However, when we switch over to anaerobic metabolism, the final electron acceptor is going to be pyruvate. Now, in this rich version of glycolysis, glucose is going to be converted to pyruvate. In the process, we are going to form ATP and H2O and 2NADH and 2 hydrogen ions. And if we were normally undergoing uh, uh, a uh, exercise, pyruvate would be shuttled into the mitochondria, decarboxylated to two enzymes, of, uh, two uh, acetylcoenzyme A. The tricarboxylic acid site will utilize acetylcholine to generate reducing equivalents of NADH and FADH. And then we go on to the electron transport chain where the final electron acceptor will be molecular oxygen to generate H2O. And we will harness the energy of the electrochemical gradient from the hydrogen ions donated to the electron transport chain for the uh, ATP synthase to generate 36 or so ATPs. 
Now, if we look a little bit closer here, when pyruvate is decarboxylated to acetyl coenzyme A, we have two other reactions, such as isocytrate going to alpha ketoglutarate and alpha ketoglutarate going to succinyl coenzyme A. And this is not stoichiometrically correct in that one pyruvate will equal two acetyl coenzyme A. Now, when we have this vigorous rush, such as in malignant hyperthermia, all those things that we saw earlier, such as the ATP from creatine phosphate, anaerobic and aerobic metabolism are going to occur at an exceedingly high rate. So therefore, these decarboxylation reactions, along with hydrogen ions that are generated, which are going to hook up with HCO3 to form H2CO3 and subsequently dissociate by carbonic anhydrase to form H2O and CO2, will increase our end tidal CO2. So the first thing that you'll see in malignant hyperthermia is going to be an increase in end tidal CO2. Now, normally, oxidative phosphorylation will result in a, um, as oxygen is consumed, in extra mitochondrial hydrogen ions increasing over time. And it's protective to the cell, so hydrogen ions don't accumulate. And the energy of the hydrogen ions, or the electrochemical gradient that's created by the hydrogen ions, will be used by ATP synthesis to synthesize ATP. Now, if we do not have enough oxygen to keep up with the demands of a electron transport chain, we're not going to be able to have oxygen be the final acceptor of electrons and form H2O. We're not going to be able to make ATP, and we're going to have to make ATP by a quick and dirty way, hence glycolysis. And in glycolysis, the end result of the two pyruvates are going to be converted to lactate. Now, when lactate is produced, you actually consume hydrogen ions, not from what conventional teaching would think or textbooks that say that lactate causes an acidosis. Lactate does not cause an acidosis. Lactate may be a good surrogate marker in acidosis. However, the acidosis that occurs in anaerobic metabolism, metabolism excuse me, is specifically by the hydrolysis of ATP in glycolysis. So we see we take the NADH and H plus that are generated in glycolysis and convert that to NAD plus in the conversion of pyruvate to lactate. Notice that without this NAD plus, we wouldn't be able to go on to the committed step of glycolysis, which is the two uh, the three possible glycerate conversion to two one three this possible glycerate, so we would not be able to make that cheap and chintzy two ADPs that we get out of glycolysis. Now that was the way that metabolism, metabolism excuse me, was indirectly stimulated from uh, malignant hyperthermia. However, glycogen in storage form one four one six branch ports is also most intimately involved with calcium. Now glycogen can be broken down to glucose 6-phosphate, and you could spare having to use one of your ATPs. And you could also, uh, in that process, decrease the hydrogen ion burden on the cell. But what happens is that in this uh, um, illustration of phosphorylase activity, which is in two states, a B form, which is an inactive form, and an A form, which is an active form. Now, phosphorylase is converted to the uh, active form in the presence of ATP, and it's says magnesium here because magnesium normally it complexes ATP uh, physiological pH. And as we add magnesium and ATP, nothing happens, but as we add calcium, we get what's called flash activation, and phosphorylase will activate and we'll be able to break down glycogen into glucose and use it for uh, subsequent cellular processes. And with depletion of ATP, keeping the, uh, the calcium concentration uh, the same, we are going to get an increase again in phosphorylase activity. In addition, if we take ethylene ditetroacetic acid, which is a chelator of calcium, and we add it to phosphorylase when it's activated, we're going to get a subsequent decrease in activity. Should we add ATP and calcium in a sufficient amount enough to overcome ethylene ditetroacetic acid's chelation, we'll be able to get an increase in phosphorylase activity. All that is a moot point because without having the ATP to activate phosphorylase, we're not going to be able to. So we're not going to have the uh, glycogen that's available in skeletal muscles for energy sources. Now this represents two different uh, exercise intensity states. The top one with a VO2 max of about 65, and the bottom with a VO2 max of about 110. And the arrows will, um, uh, and the, uh, the arrows will represent the metabolic byproducts and the relative importance of the enzymatic pathways. Now notice in the top we get our uh, energy from glucose or glycogen, we generate pyruvate, we generate NADH, 2-HT, 2 hydrogen ions, 2 ATPs, and it goes into the mitochondria to the tricarboxylic acid cycle to uh, generate some ATPs, and we uh, provide uh, cell work from the ATPs that's harnessed from that process. 
and the phosphate is going to be cycled into the mitochondria as well. So hydrogen ion cycle into the mitochondria to, to uh, uh, function in the electron transport tank to generate more ATPs. Now, at high exercise intensity, this VO2 max is about 110%. We'll fatigue in about two to three minutes. That's probably likely what you see in malignant hyperthermia. And notice here that despite the fact that this glycogen arrow is thicker than the arrow on top, we're not going to be able to utilize glycogen. The glucose 6-phosphate that's going to be uh, created by glycolysis, glycolysis excuse me, is going to be converted to pyruvate. But since we need the quick, dirty energy of glycolysis, these pyruvates are going to be converted to lactate. We're going to generate NAD, and uh, we're going to subsequently rely on glycolysis to uh, derive our energy sources. The NADH and the two H pluses that are formed are going to be used by nitrogen dehydrogenase to form lactate so we can continue with glycolysis. In addition, the phosphate that's formed after cellular work with the uh, hydrolysis of ADP, ADP phosphate and hydrogen ions will be used again by glycolysis to form ATP. And hydrogen ions that were subsequently being used in the mitochondria for the electron transport chain are going to be accumulating, and that's said to be um, a pH accumulation in the cell, and hence an acidosis that develops. Now, we saw before that by the decarboxylation of acetylcholine, or sorry, of pyruvate, and various other um, intermediates in the Krebs cycle, that we get an increase in entitled CO2. Now, we have chemoreceptors that are located in aortic arch, our carotid body, as well as in the uh, bula. And these chemoreceptors' specific and sole purpose is to change our vasomotor activity, our heart rate, as well as our um, respiratory rate to adapt to these changes. Now, if we get an increase in CO2 and H plus and a decrease in oxygen content, we're going to get an increased chemoreceptor binding. Subsequently, we get an increase in sympathetic uh, tone and an increase in systemic vascular resistance, further dissipating heat dispersion. As well, we get a decrease in parathetic sympathetic tone and we get an increase in cardiac output. So the two things that you'll see first in a person that's undergoing malignant hyperthermia is an increase in entitled CO2 and tachycardia. Now, tetany occurs when there is an abundance of calcium that's found in troponin, uh, and um, that calcium is not able to be pumped preferentially out into the matrix. That pump needs ATP. Should we not have ATP available, it would deplete uh, the, uh, uh, the, the depletion of ATP, um, causes a, uh, a, a subsequent buildup of calcium. And what will happen is myosin is going to remain in its lower energy state, as we saw before, and any additional contraction is going to be a very, very small uh, movement. And in depth, what happens is equilibri equilibration. And the first thing that equilibrates is uh, the ions. And calcium will move down to troponin C as much as it possibly can, and we'll get an early onset of rigor mortis, mortis should death occur secondary to malignant hypothermia. Now, the agents that are commonly involved in malignant hyperthermia, the halogenated anesthetics, um, such as enfluorane here, halogen here, epoxyfluorine, acetylfluorine, and uh, isofluorine. And the odd man out is succinylcholine. And, and I make a point of showing succinylcholine in that it is likely that succinylcholine probably binds somewhere else other than the place where these halogenated anesthetics bind. Now, you could sort of say that these halogenated anesthetics being electronegative would bind to a receptor by uh, electrostatic interactions and so forth. And these nitrogen ions, which are in the, um, which you can't really make out too well, are positive as well. But acetyl succinylcholine is structurally similar to acetylcholine, so you have to sort of say that the succinylcholine binds somewhere up in the motor interplate. Another thing that can occur is a um, resurgence of. Um, of malignant hyperthermia after the initial event, sometimes 24 to 36 hours afterwards. Usually it occurs in about 12 hours. And the thing with succinylcholine is, is that only 5% of what is administered IV actually makes it to the motor end plate. And then you would surmise that pseudocholine esterate is, is going to break down any succinylcholine that's there. So there has to be some kind of physiological change that occurs in order for a recurrence to occur with the administration of succinylcholine in the malignant hyperthermia. Now the clinical features which we spoke about before uh, they're not really uniform and onset is variable. The most frequent sign, as we emphasized before, is tachycardia from the input to uh, chemoreceptors, as well as an end, a rise in entitled carbon dioxide. And the interesting thing is masseter muscle spasm. And masseters have more type 2 oxidative fibers than type 1 oxidative fibers. And I could not find any case that um, outlined uh, or described masseter muscle spasm 
with halogenated anesthetics. It all occurs with succinylcholine, and I can't quite figure out why. Um, also, someone can get kidney for obvious reasons as well as rigidity for reasons like describing and hyperthermia. Now, I don't think I have to tell this audience about the EIC and cellular death that occurs uh, in response to malignant hyperthermia, but as acidosis ensues, the uh, various proteins of the body, which have a midazolian rings on them, are protonated, and that disturbs their function. Additionally, as hyperthermia ensues, you disrupt the tertiary structure of proteins. That's why you see things like DASC. Calcium is intimately involved in cellular death, so you have to anticipate potential hyperkidemia and so forth from uh, cellular death. Now, if you're not quite getting this yet, you'll find that this sign definitely has some sharp edges, but the bridge is out ahead. And you can easily see how a person in the operating room would say that maybe this isn't enough anesthesia or enough pain medication when a person becomes tachycardic. Now, the diagnosis, um, and we won't be making the diagnosis as, well, we could presumably make the diagnosis as ED physicians, but the gold standard was a caffeine, caffeine halogen contraction test and an in vitro contraction test. But there are many things on the horizon. Probably the thing that's most promising is molecular genetic testing. There's also in vivo microinjection of caffeine. NMRS can measure ATP, pH, and creatine phosphate in contracting muscles. The lymphocytes have brand and receptors. And there's also markers for calcium ion concentrations, such as various guises, like pure too. And the management upon establishing the diagnosis is immediately discontinuing the triggering agent. Administer 100% oxygen, increase minute ventilation, anticipate, oh, excuse me, anticipate potential complications, as well as general supportive measures. Now, dantrolene will decrease ionized calcium release, will prevent the calcium-dependent contraction path in myosin, and it does not completely paralyze the muscle due to its limited water solubility. You have to understand that dantrolene has some characteristics that are similar to anticonvulsants, such as phenytoin. This is actually the high dantoid ring. Um, as well as local anesthetics, but it doesn't have any of those properties. And you can sort of stretch and say dantrolene is very structurally similar to succinylcholine. If you don't have dantrolene, <laughs> I know a place in Ohio where you can get paddles to paddle through the crack. <laughs> anyway, now it's taught in textbooks that dantrolene binds to rhyming binding sites. Now that very well may not be true. Various concentrations, 200 nanomolar and 5 nanomolar of dantrolene radio label and ryanine uh, uh, radio label uh, were tested for um, different um, uh, chemicals that either will inhibit the ryanine receptor, will stimulate the ryanine receptor. Now we notice here in the control of uh, dantrolene and ryanine, if we add dantrolene of a concentration of 10 micromolar, we don't get any appreciable change in the ryanine binding. We add azulimolene, which binds similar to dantrolene, we don't get any appreciable change in the ryanamine binding as well. If we add ryanamine, notice we don't get any appreciable change in the uh, dantrolene binding. If we add caffeine, which is a stimulator of the ryanamine receptor at one nanomolar or one micromolar, excuse me, concentration, we don't get any change in the radial label dantrolene that's found, however, we do get an increase in the um, ryanamine radio label that's found. If we increase that concentration, we also dramatically increase the binding of ryanamine, hence we're stimulating the ryanamine receptor, receptor and having more ryanamine bind, but there's no change in dantrolene. If we add ruthenium, which is an inhibitor of ryanamine receptor, notice we get no change with dantrolene, but we get a decrease in ryanamine binding, and as we increase that up to 100 micromolar concentration, we get virtually no or none actually ryanamine bound. So this sort of confirms that there may be two separate binding sites. And obviously this was done, well, I shouldn't say obviously, but this was done in the swine model. It may very well be different from the human model. When they further went on to um, differentiate the uranidine radio label binding as well as the uh, dantrolene radio label binding and sucrose weight by volume, they noticed that there was two overlapping, uh, two separate but overlapping uh, areas. And this sort of, you know, leads you to think that maybe there is a binding site or maybe there located near each other, and then when they separated it out on the western block, there was no dramatic difference at all, or no difference at all that could be appreciated from either of the findings. So what we'll say is that calcium, uh, or that dantrolene binds to the ranidine receptor for simplistic purposes, and decreases the release of calcium, and you don't get that physiological process that we saw outlined in the living 
The dose, you're probably going to have to look this up, but one milligram per kilogram, and you pray and hope it works. And then you could obviously give them as much as it takes. And before we go on to neuroleptic malignant syndrome, we should sort of talk about the similarities between neuroleptic malignant syndrome and uh, malignant hyperthermia. Neuroleptic malignant syndrome is often referred to as a neurogenic form of malignant hyperthermia. Now, the features that are similar and dissimilar as well is that obviously skeletal muscle cells is where malignant hyperthermia occurs, and nerve cell is where neuroleptic malignant syndrome occurs. The predominant isoform of the random gene receptors, RYR1, which you saw in skeletal muscle cells, and RYR2 in uh, nerve cells. The calcium channel in skeletal muscle cells is the L, long sustained conductance, whereas in nerve cells, it's the N. The calcium induced calcium release mechanism is secondary to sodium entry in skeletal muscle cells, and it's the primary release of neurotransmitter in nerve cells. The calcium storage sites are similar in the sarcoplasmic reticulum is a storage site for uh, skeletal muscle cells, and the endoplasmic reticulum is a site for nerve cells. The calcium storage regulators are pretty much the same in oxytocin triphosphate and neuronic receptors, and membrane depolarization uh, will result in contraction in skeletal muscle cells and excess hydrosis in nerve cells, and the inhibitory neurotransmitters. GABA being the main inhibitory neurotransmitter in skeletal muscle cells, or at least in the spinal cord, and in nerve cells, it's dopamine and GABA. So there's lots of similarities between neuroleptic malignant syndrome and malignant hyperthermia, and you have to make a uh, correlation as well as a distinction between the two. Neuroleptic malignant syndrome is sort of misleading in the sense that it implies that you have to be on a neuroleptic. But neuroleptic malignant syndrome occurs uh, without the administration of neuroleptics, but more so with the administration of other drugs that are used as dopamine antagonists. In addition, in Parkinson's disease with the treatment of L-DOVA, neuroleptic malignant syndrome has been implicated and people who uh, abruptly discontinued their L-DOVA. Thousands of cases have been reported. There's no single diagnostic criteria that is adapted for general use uh, in neuroleptic malignant syndrome. There's many theories, and sometimes you see in textbooks dopamine on a seesaw and acetylcholine at the top of the seesaw. And uh, that may be uh, one of the theories between, uh, between uh, or uh, with altered sense of dopamine transmission. Imbalance of GABA, gamma mediated acid, which is the main inhibitory neurotransmitter, and 5-HT, which is serotonin, mutation with the RYR3 and B2 receptors, and abnormal uh, reaction to predisposed skeletal muscle. Now, there's many, um, or I'm sorry, there's three major pathways of dopamine in the brain, the nigrostriatal pathway, which we think that blockage of dopamine in that pathway is the um, uh, one that's most important in the pathogenesis of neuroleptic malignant syndrome. As well, we have the mesocortical pathway and the tubero-infundibular pathway, and another subset of the uh, uh, mesocortical pathway, the mesolimbic pathway. So you see the dopamine is diverse uh, in the brain and reaches basically all parts of the brain. Now, we have also isolated the male brain. And notice that the male brain is devoid of the <laughs> dopamine pathways. Instead, there's quite a bit of sex generated. And I would swear that the people that I work with don't even have any toilet aiming cell capabilities. <laughs> I refuse to go to the bathroom with a poison center because it's, it's almost like swimming on a toilet seat. The lame exclusive gland, the attention span. And I imagine this attention span is probably a lot more generous than I would think the normal male has. So moving on, blockade dopamine receptors in the hypothalamus is thought to lead to impaired. He is a patient. Blockaded dopamine receptors in the corpus striatum is thought to cause muscular rigidity, and the peripheral anticholinergic effects of traditional neuroleptics are also thought to contribute to the development of hyperthermia and neuroleptic malignant syndrome. And hypothalamic regulation is not only uh, regulated by dopamine, but noradrenergic, as well as serotonergic and cholinergic pathways, so it's very, very complex. Now, dopamine is synthesized from tyrosine. Uh, which is converted to L-DOPA by tyrosine hydroxylase, or we can take L-DOPA in exogenously as a precursor for dopamine synthesis. It's packaged in presynaptic vesicles and subsequently fuses within the synaptic area, and dopamine diffuses into the synaptic cleft. That there to work with dopamine receptors, and specifically we're thinking about D2 receptors that are antagonized with uh, traditional uh, antipsychotics, but there's also D1 receptors and so forth. Dopamine can also uh, undergo a, um, a reaction with catalyl altered methyl transferase to form three methyl tyrosine that's interacted on by monoamine oxidase to form homo vanillic acid, which can actually be a marker of dopamine activity. Or dopamine can be taken up by the dopamine transporter, subsequently repackaged into uh, synaptic vesicles, or it can be degraded by monoamine oxidase to deaminated products. One point that I should make, and it's probably more important to make with, um, with uh, serotonin syndrome, 
is that largely what we're talking about is um, drug-related disorders that are iatrogenic. But uh, St. John's Wort, which is an over-the-counter um, uh, agent or health food stores, has some mild monoamine oxidase uh, uh, inhibiting activities. So sort of plugging away all the stuff that we spoke about, neuroleptics or withdrawal of L-dopamine because sympathetic hyperactivity, central dopamine blockade can cause um, changes in the hypothalamus, which can lead to hyperthermia as well as autonomic instability. The peripheral effects or the effects that are uh, attributed to the damage of skeletal muscle is evidenced by the high CK or the central dopamine blockade that occurs in the corpus striatum can lead to the muscular rigidity uh, that we see in neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Various drug causes such that can occur in the presynaptic area with recipine and terbentamine, which are catecholamine depleters for lack of better terms. Anything that is a syncopalimetic that blocks the reuptake of whether it be norepinephrine or whatever it is can also cause um, uh, neuroleptic malignant syndrome. So cocaine or amphetamines. And cocaine is almost specifically supposed to uh, inhibit the reuptake of norepinephrine, but norepinephrine is very structurally similar to dopamine, it's very structurally to serotonin, so you're not going to get only one that's going to be inhibited. And then postsynaptic, probably one that we're most familiar with is the antipsychotic medication, endoperiol, methylprochromine. I noticed the methylprochromine is not traditionally classified as neuroleptic, nor with these other groups that we spoke about, chlorocorpazine, promethazine, as well as reduced postsynaptic simulation, such as with pergolide, or bromokiptine, and bromokiptine is actually used in the treatment of neuroleptic malignant syndrome. It's a D1 antagonist and a D2 agonist. Now, in the Journal of Psychiatric Research, they measured the uh, CSF um, uh, in 11 patients who were um, uh, diagnosed as having neuroleptic malignant syndrome, and they compared this to eight matched controls. They measured homovanilic acid, which is a measure of dopamine, 5-HIIAA, 5-hydroxymethylacetic acid, which is a measure of serotonin, norepinephrine as well as 3-MN, which is a metabolite product of norepinephrine, and gamma-amino butyric acid, the main inhibitory neurotransmitter in the central nervous system. In these 11 patients, the HPA dramatically decreased during the active phase and also decreased during recovery. Now, that sort of signifies the uh, hypofunction of the dopaminergic nervous system in the pathogenesis of norepinephrine malignant syndrome. Additionally, 5-HIAA was decreased, but it really wasn't significant. So we don't know how much serotonin is involved in neuroleptic malignant syndrome. And as you would suspect, with the hypersympathetic hyperactivity, norepinephrine and 3 m were increased during the active phase, and they were normal after recovery, and gamma butyric acid, the main inhibitory neurotransmitter in the CNS, was decreased in comparison to controls. Now, previous skeletal muscle is also thought to be involved in the pathogenesis of neuroleptic malignant syndrome. And NMS and MH have common traits, such as the elevated CK, such as the fever, such as the, uh, the uh, rigidity and so forth. And dantrolene has also been used successfully in both syndromes. And abnormal IVCT, or the uh, in vitro caffeine uh, contracture test, has been found in patients with both, uh, not be positive in patients with both NMS and MH. But it's really, really conflicting that Carol described five of seven patients that were susceptible to NMH. But subsequently, ADNET described 13 or 14 patients that were diagnosed with NMS but were not susceptible to malignant hyperthermia. So the jury's out there whether or not they're truly separate entities or are they overlapping entities. And the risk factors for neuroleptics would include higher dose, increased doses over a short time, parental administration. The ratio of drug is not related, and it can occur at any time during use. And single large ingestion is not related. So you're not likely to see it in an overdose or even more likely to see someone who therapeutically uh, takes these drugs for a long period of time. Now, risk factors also include if your right eye pops out, or if you have young age, male, dehydration, <laughs> infection, malnutrition, ethanol abuse, and also genetic, as evidenced in twins with the TAC ALO for D2 receptor. Has anyone ever seen anything like that? Ooh. That eye? Neither have I. And I saw this patient in St. Michael's, and, and I had to take a picture of it. And she obviously was consenting, but she also was on her left. But her family was there and I got permission. And um, essentially what happened was the <laughs> mucosa that supports her eye had popped out. She waited about 24 hours prior to coming into the emergency department. And there was all pus which she really can't make out uh, uh, from the picture. And you could probably think of what it was like trying to reduce that eye. Needless to say, we were unsuccessful. And I don't know what happened to her follow-up. We tried to call and uh, no one had answered. So maybe I'll have a uh, follow-up for you one day. Anyway. The presentation for neuroleptic malignant syndrome progresses over 24 to 40, 42, 72 hours, excuse me, lasts about 10 to 20 days. And the buzzword is left hyperjitterity, which 
sort of confers its resistance to passive movement and tremor, autonomic instability, and altered mental status. Now, the limitation of the diagnosis of the DSM-4R in the development of neuroleptic movement syndrome is it has to happen with the use of antipsychotic medication in order to be diagnosed only by DSM-4R. And obviously, we know that antipsychotic medications aren't necessarily um, uh, the etiologies uh, for neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Levson's criteria, fever, rigidity, and elevated CPK. Should you have all three of those, you could be diagnosed with neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Or should you have two of the major and five of the minor, you could be diagnosed by Levson as having um, uh, neuroleptic malignant syndrome. The diagnosis is obviously exclusionary. You will want to entice if there's any recent use or change of dopamine antagonists. Labs are really not so specific. What you could hang your head on is there's going to be an increased CPK, there'll be a leukocytosis, and so on and so forth. Obviously, you want to discontinue any potential etiologic agents. This can really be a problem should a person have a depo preparation. Benzodiazepines for muscle rigidity. You can never go wrong with benzodiazepines. I don't know if anybody who's ever had an uh, allergic reaction to benzodiazepines. Uh, external cooling, bromocryptine, and dantrolene, as we said, has been used successfully. You don't really have to know the dosages, but essentially, dantrolene or bromocryptine supportive management, obviously, would be the things that we would use to treat a person uh, with a neuroleptic syndrome. And obviously, we can all get ECT in our emergency department, so that is something that you can have to expose, as well as amantadine, which is an antiviral agent, which is a dopamine uh, agonist, and even dopa, uh, if a person has Parkinson's disease and comes with signs and symptoms that are similar, you want, you're going to want to ask, has there been a recent dis dis decrease in uh, dosage, has there been a recent change in medication, and so forth. Moving on to serotonin syndrome, and I apologize, I started late, I'm trying to be an academic athlete. I'll try to do uh, serotonin syndrome in about 12 minutes. Right. So anyway, serotonin is uh, produced peripherally in enterochromophid cells. It's taken up by the platelets in the splanchic circulation. circulation. It does not cross the blood-brain barrier, so it has to be produced in the CNS. It's produced centrally in the lower palms and upper brain stem in nine discrete nuclei. They have projections to the thalamus and cortex, which are ascending projections, which are generally inhibitory. There's also projections to the medulla and spinal cord, which are descending projections, which are generally excitatory. Serotonin is involved in multiple peripheral as well as central effects, such as stimulating smooth muscle, promoting vasoconstriction, involved in platelet aggregation, intestinal peristalsis. And this is really the, uh, where uh, a drug such as Propulsive, which is a 5-HT4 agonist, makes its place, or a drug such as Zofran, which is a 5-HT3 antagonist, and 5-HT4 uh, antagonist makes its way. Uh, uterine contraction serotonin is involved in, as well as bronchial constriction. Serotonin also inhibits excitatory neurotransmission, regulates effect and personality, sleep, appetite, temperature regulation, sexual function, and aggression. And this is perfectly exemplified on a person who is under the influence of uh, MDMA or ecstasy. It's a highly serotonergic drug, and we all know the stories of people having sex for uh, five days uh, when they're on ecstasy. Um, serotonin is also involved in motor control, pain perception, cardiorespiratory function. It's also a precursor to melatonin in the pineal gland. And as far as the serotonin receptors are uh, concerned, the last time I checked there was 5-HT1 to 5-HT7. It's growing every day. It is the most diverse receptor system in the body. We have a good understanding of the first four receptors, 5-HT1 to 5-HT4. And each class may contain a subclass. 5-HT1A and 5-HT2A are the two receptors that are believed to be involved in the pathogenesis of serotonin syndrome. 5-HT1D I mentioned because any presynaptic located uh, uh, serotonin receptor will help in decreasing the release of serotonin uh, syndrome. And in my experience, serotonin syndrome has been fairly short-lived, and it may very well be from the stimulation of the 5-HT1A and 5-HT1D receptors. The history of serotonin is as such first recognized, but not necessarily coined as serotonin in 1955, with muscular hyperactivity and so forth with a person that was taking ipronizide, a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, and meperidine. In 1960, tryptophan, in, in combination with the monoamine oxidase inhibitor, resulted in ataxia, hyperreflexia, clonus, and tremor, diaphoresis, and lightheadedness. In 1963, they fed monkeys L-tryptophan, and they got similar symptoms. And in 1982, INSEL finally coined the term serotonin syndrome with a reaction that occurred with um, clomiphene and a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. Now, the serotonin syndrome is a drug-induced disorder. There is no endogenous counterpart, or no, uh, um, no natural endogenous counterpart. 
It results in variable alterations in cognition and behavior, neuromuscular activity, and autonomic nervous system dysfunction. And we said before that it's specifically 5-HT1 agonism and 5-HT2 agonism that is thought to be uh, involved in the pathogenesis of serotonin syndrome. No gender prohibition, idiosyncratic in nature, and a patient is not more likely to develop serotonin syndrome after an overdose or when they're taking therapeutic doses, and it's essentially a diagnosis of exclusion. Also, addition of a serotonergic drug, usually a, therapeutic, uh, usually a therapeutic doses, can cause serotonin syndrome, increasing primary drug, or a person may have reduced activity of monoamine oxidase, or there may be some genetic variation. Now, serotonergic agents can work in one of a few ways. They can either inhibit 5-HT uptake, which we'll look at. They can enhance 5-HT release. They can inhibit 5-HT breakdown. They can be metabolized to 5-HT. They can be 5-HT1A agonists, or they can enhance 5-HT receptor response to stimulation. Now, serotonin is uh, synthesized from L-tryptophan, um, which is decarboxylated, if I'm not mistaken, to 5-hydroxytryptophan. And by aromatic amino acid decarboxylated, 5-HT is created and stored in synaptic vesicles. If we increase L-tryptophan, such as it was fed into the monkeys um, in 1960, we could cause a serotonin syndrome. Any drug that's sympathomimetic that can cause a release of norepinephrine, epinephrine, and so forth, so amphetamines, cocaine, pseudoephedrine, can cause relief of, release of 5-HT2 with subsequent release of serotonin. Any monoamine oxidase inhibitor, linazolide, which is an antibiotic that's uh, becoming more and more popular, has some monoamine oxidase inhibiting uh, capability, St. John's wort, as well as the traditional monoamine oxidase inhibitors. The largest class of drugs inhibit the reuptake of serotonin, and those are the SSRIs or the SNRIs. The combination of the SSRIs or an increase in dosing of SSRIs may very well cause a serotonin syndrome. Additionally, bupropion, which is a 5-HT1A agonist, can also cause signs and symptoms of, uh, of uh, serotonin syndrome, should it be in combination with another serotonin agent. And then lithium, with, among another mechanism, is thought to increase the postsynaptic receptor potential response from serotonin. Now sort of as a review, specific SSRs that we spoke about in the 5 hd update, you know, TCAs, no one can forget about the paradine, dextromethorphan, tramadol, dextronormine. You also have to consider lithium as being a serotonin agent, which in addition to uh, uh, increasing the postsynaptic receptor response, also enhances 5 hd release. Methylene dimethoxy methamphetamine is the perfect serotonin drug. Cocaine, amphetamines, fenfluramine, and dextronormine. I'm a new uncle, I'm this Ooh. bouncing baby boy, and he's not being breastfeed, so I don't think he's talking about uh, breast milk, but he's saying, damn, this stuff is good, and I'm worried about this little guy. <laughs> anyway, 5 ac one include also LSD, boosterone, sumatriptan, as well as dihydrocotamine. And to make this long lecture a little bit longer, we'll talk about the drugs that inhibit 5 ac breakdown, such as monoamine oxidase inhibitors, uh, metabolized to 5 ht uh, precursor tryptophan, and lithium, which we saw before, will also uh, cause a postsynaptic uh, response. Now, any drug combination of potentially serotonergic agents can cause serotonin syndrome. And I'm not going to believe this issue, but if you add a serotonergic drug on top of another serotonergic drug, there's a potential that you may get serotonin syndrome. Serotonin syndrome has been associated with monotherapy with clomipramine, fluvoxamine, phenylphaxine, and BMA and sertraline. Last time I checked, there may be other ones that you have to add to this. And it's all, you always have to inquire to your patients, are they on you know, an over-the-counter agent such as an herbal supplement, St. John's Ward, if you're ever entertaining the uh, diagnosis of serotonin syndrome. As we said before, there's abnormal functioning in cognitive and behavioral, neuromuscular, <coughs> autonomic nervous system, symptom onset and intensity are variable, and symptoms occur relatively soon after the enticing event. Now, Mills did a really great thing. He looked at about 127 or so cases of um, serotonin syndrome and gave us a number of how many of them had confusion and so forth. And we said before that there's cognitive and behavioral change. Confusion occurred in about 54% of people that were diagnosed as having serotonin syndrome. Agitation and all the way down to hallucinations at the end. Blood pressure liability, about 47%. I really haven't appreciated the hyperthermia internal at all in serotonin syndrome. Um, but that supposedly occurred at 46%. Diaphoresis. Um, and probably the thing that, you, that will tip you off is lower extremity um, uh, stiffness more so than in comparison to upper extremity stiffness. This may very well have to do 
with um, uh, serotonin and not being able to get into the blood-brain barrier competes with other catecholamines uh, to go into the blood-brain barrier, or it might have to do with some kind of spinal cord uh, uh, effect from serotonin syndrome. Uh, no one really knows. Hyperreflexive can occur, rigidity, and so on and so forth. Uh, two animal models, um, they uh, induced a serotonin syndrome uh, with a combination of drugs, tensicopropamine and fluoxetine and chlorigiline, excuse me, and precursor for serotonin synthesis, 5 hydroxy l tryptophan They recorded rectal temperature and they also measured serotonin, dopamine, and glutamine. The behaviors of uh, typical serotonin syndrome occurred in 90 minutes in the first group, which was the tensicopropamine and fluoxetine, and 30 minutes in the second group, which was the chlorigiline and 5 hydroxy l tryptophan there was an increase in rectal temperature 90 minutes in the first group, which reached 43 Celsius in 240 minutes. And immediate increase in rectal temperature in the uh, second group that reached 40 degrees Celsius in 120 minutes. As far as 5-HD is concerned, it slowly increased about 40-fold in the first group. And at 360 minutes, it was 40-fold and gradually decreased. In the second group, it increased rapidly and reached about 140-fold at 90 minutes and then rapidly decreased thereafter. This sort of just goes to show you that the variability in presentation from the combination of the agents uh, and serotonin syndrome. Dopamine rapidly increased about 44 fold, 44 fold, excuse me, in the uh, first group, and increased to about 10 fold at 360 minutes in the second group. Glutamate, which is one of the excitatory neurotransmitters, there was no change for 120 minutes, but it increased to about 4.4 fold at about 360 minutes, and there was no significant change in the second group with the precursor of tryptophan and chlorine. Now, Sterbach suggested this diagnostic criteria, probably the one that's most, uh, most used for the diagnosis of serotonin syndrome. Basically, you have to add or increase a known serotonin drug in at least three to five. Agitation, diaphoresis, diarrhea, fever, and so on and so forth. You have to rule out other etiologies, and a neuroleptic agent has not been started to uh, been started or increase the doses. Obvious limitation uh, there is they're trying to make a correlation here between neuroleptic and malignant syndrome or ruling out neuroleptic and malignant syndrome. It's not only neuroleptic that can cause neuroleptic. Criticisms. Other criteria include Hergel criteria, Dursum, random speed, most criteria, 100 decision, and we can all jump on the bandwagon. Tammy Schaefer and I are going to make some criteria, but I have a shiny criteria, which is just called the Poison Center, and we can talk about it. The time course is usually abrupt, occurs for an hour. What's that? Which Poison Center? My Poison Center. Um, yeah. <laughs> Whichever one you want. <laughs> well, if you get the Poison Center, you talk to me, you don't have to hang up, but if you get anyone else, you can hang up. <laughs> The time course is usually abrupt, occurs within hours after initiation of new serotonergic agents. Two thirds of cases result within 24 hours. Uh, uh, Dr. Schaefer had described to you a patient that she had in uh, uh, Colorado that had a, uh, maybe over a week, did you say? Yeah, it was a Lexapro who over five days um, had to, it kept it paralyzed. Every time they had paralyzed, it got rigid and hypodermic. For five days, it got infected. Yeah, the, the big joke in Arizona was when we were transferring patients that had. Um, serotonin syndrome, by the time they got to us, they wouldn't even need to be treated. And we just sort of made a joke of, oh, when they come, we'll just discharge them. And we did that a few times. But then sometimes we had some pretty good um, uh, serotonin syndrome uh, patients. Uh, five patient management principles, supportive care, and obviously discontinue uh, uh, serotonin agents, anticipate potential complications. And we're not going to do this as ED docs, but you know, you want to reassess the need for the institute of clinical therapy. Antipyretics are generally infected. In fact, you can't go wrong with that. It's no specific antidote, but the thing that we have the most, um, uh, the most uh, experience with is ciproheptidine or periactin. Ciproheptidine is the only agent that's anti-muscarinic, anti anti-histaminic, and anti-serotonergic. It's the most consistently effective. Blocks postnaptic 5-HT1A and 5-HT2 receptors, are, which are the ones implicated in the pathogenesis of serotonin, serotonin syndrome. It's only available orally. So you would have to administer by an NG tube should a person not be able to um, take the opioid. Now you also have to make a distinction between uh, the, the pathology of neuroleptic malignant syndrome and serotonin syndrome. Just as before, we spoke about the uh, similarities between neuroleptic malignant syndrome and malignant hypothermia. The agents involved in NMS, and I really should have put other agents in here, but neuroleptics as well as uh, withdrawal of uh, L-DOPA or uh, bromocryptine, bromocryptine, which is dopamine agonist and antagonist. And serotonin uh, agonist here, and we have to expand the list to include monoamine oxidative members like St. John's wort, venezolide, which are common recognized dextromethorphan, and so on and so forth. The onset of neuroleptic malignant syndrome is said to be gradual, that of serotonin syndrome is said to be in minutes to hours. 
um, the original neuroleptical limiting syndrome, and the tip off in my in uh, serotonin syndrome is lower extremity um, uh, stiffness in comparison to upper extremity stiffness. And uh, rigidity in NMS is said to be lead hyper. Seizures aren't really likely in NMS, a little bit more likely in serotonin syndrome. I haven't appreciated this at all. Uh, labs, now with the labs in neuroleptic malignant syndrome, you could really expect that you're going to have a high K and you might have some other laboratory abnormalities, a uh, high CK, I'm sorry, uh, an increase in WBC, increase in LFTs, maybe some renal insufficiency or renal failure, and a low incidence of laboratory abnormalities in serotonin syndrome. The resolution for neuroleptic malignant syndrome is about nine days, that of serotonin syndrome is about 12 to 24 hours. So in summary, MH involves the you know, release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Specifically, we think it's a mutation in the RYR1 receptor. However, you can't discount the contribution of inositol triphosphate, as well as other various uh, things that have been implicated in causing malignant hyperthermia. Imagine it includes withdrawal of the offending agent, um, as well as dancrine, and we've spoken about the use of dancrine before. You want to anticipate potential complicated complications, such as hyperkalemia, such as managing their hyperthermia, and so forth. Malignant hyperthermia, NMS, and serotonin syndrome are clinically similar as we have outlined. They're characterized by altered mental status, fever, as well as motor hyperactivity. History of medication use will help determine which syndrome is present rather than clinical findings, and you must exclude infectious as well as other etiology. Thank you very much for your time. Feel free to call the Poison Center anytime. I have two questions for you. Now, with, um, with the NMS, when they did that VA study and um, did those LPs, how do you explain the, the decrease in the GABA levels? And then I, I couldn't really explain it. I, I could say that I know GABA is the main inhibitory neurotransmitter. It may have something to do with the hypofunctioning of dopamine, decrease in GABA, or the increase in uh, norepinephrine and epinephrine decrease in GABA. But I couldn't think of any valid scientific reason why GABA would decrease. And then the second question is, with serotonin syndrome, why is there more effect on the lower extremity than the upper extremity? Yeah. Um, you know, I couldn't really answer that either. I know serotonin is not taken up in the blood-brain barrier. It may very well compete, compete with other catecholamines. It may have more of a peripheral effect and therefore more of an effect on the uh, lower extremity, but that's only yeah. speculation. Yeah. Maybe Tammy knows. Well, nobody really knows. The other speculation about is muscle group size. Is, is that that's a possibility? Hmm. Is that it's purely a function of the muscle group size as to why? But it's more prominent for lower extremities. You both, at, at John, that was incredible. I, I want to copy that to study for my course. Um, <laughs> you have to pay me 43 cents. Excellent. Um, but I mean, I think, I think a couple things is that is a tip off. They do get rigid and they do get very stiff. Clearly, lower extremity before upper extremity. And the thing about the seizures, John, is you're right. I think what people are identifying with seizures. Are really is really just significant myoclonus because from a from a pathophysiologic perspective, the myoclonus we can understand. I don't it doesn't make sense to me why it would cause all myoclonus. 